Are you guys ready? Yeah, yeah ready. Set. It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. I'm still finishing the last of my post-run breakfast shake. Dang, it's early, Val. I know, you're not kidding me, but we're doing some double time this week, and we're getting some interviews in the hopper, so we are locked and loaded, and of course, we're going to be in Portland for the Society Wine Educators Conference, and so we're going to load some episodes so we can uh, enjoy the conference while you guys can enjoy the show. So in this episode, we actually did connect with Jordan Cowie. He is also a certified wine educator from our little family of certified wine educators. And we met him at a conference and he lives in Canada, in Niagara on the Lake. Yes, yes. And Jordan is the co-founder of Be Wineful. And prior to starting Be Wineful, Jordan was busy meditating and working his way through the wine industry. Jordan entered the wine industry and began his meditation practice after the sudden onset of panic disorder and agoraphobia, which made him reevaluate his life and career. Starting out behind the tasting bar, he has since had the opportunity to work as a training manager for 180 staff, a marketing consultant, and most importantly to him as a wine educator in a variety of situations from consumers to professionals. Jordan became the world's youngest certified wine educator in 2015, winning the Banffy Award for highest score on the year's exam. He is now combining his love of wine and meditation and sharing his story and approach through Be Wineful. But before we dish out this interview with Jordan and all of the Be Wineful, Be Thankfulness, let's introduce our breakfast beverages in front of us. After all, it's not five o'clock and we don't care. Val, what kind of business are you drinking? Well, I'm actually being bourbonful this morning. <laughs> bourbonful. And That's I'm right. ginful. I'm- You're ginful. So I I think it says a lot when it's not even noon and we're pouring a liquor in our glasses. But some days it's all I can do to keep it out of my coffee. But it is a treat that I've been eyeing for some time. So in my glass today is Amador Whiskey Company's Double Barrel. Doesn't that sound sexy? That's a mouthful. I know, right? And We all know that bourbon can be made anywhere in America and that 95% of it comes from Kentucky. And so does this. But wait, Val, you said Amador. And we all know from listening to the show that Amador is in California. Yes, it is. So the bourbon itself is made in Kentucky and it's aged in the requisite American white oak charred barrels, as all bourbons are. But then this particular bourbon is shipped to California where it sits in wine barrels from Napa Valley. So this is one of those cool crossover products we talked about with Suzanne Redman of Cask Magazine yeah. back in episode 103 during our whiskey chat. So bourbon is not just for breakfast anymore. But I do have to give a little cocktail shout out because... If you do want to have this bourbon for breakfast, they have a cocktail called the shotgun. And I had it last night because remember, I drink what I want whenever I want, whatever time of day. But the shotgun cocktail has apricot jam in it, bourbon maple syrup and bitters. And then, of course, this double barrel bourbon and it's shaken. And it reminds me of like a fruitier version of an old fashioned. That sounds so good. And I I think I have just enough apricot jam, like maybe a little bit less for, than a full serving but it should uh-huh. make me one of those shotgun cocktails. <laughs> you know what? If you've got it in the jar, I would just leave it in there because oh. you only need a teaspoon of the jam. Oh, put the bourbon in and the then jar. Just throw the bourbon in the jar, shake in some bitters, and put in a quarter an ounce of, I use the Trader Joe's bourbon barrel maple syrup, but whatever maple syrup you have, throw it in there, throw a little bit of ice, shake, 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 and right into your cocktail glass, recycle the jar, boom. Or just drink it out of the jar, girl, I dare you. <laughs> Maybe I should make a video. <laughs> All right. 
That's a good dare because I'm going to do that. And then we should let <laughs> Juliet Miranda know about it for her show. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I, this is a really nice bourbon. It's it's definitely got that more dark fruit. Remember, my, my favorite new blade and bow is more tropical and melony. And this reminds me more of like some dark berries, which I don't usually get in bourbon. Yeah. So more like dark fruit. It's just this really nice, I mean, it's still pretty bright. And what's really cool is when you mix it into the cocktail, that combined with that maple bourbon syrup, it reminds me of this long butterscotch finish. Yeah, that sounds good. Is, I love butterscotch. Yeah, so I really like this. This is a really nice spicy bourbon, as you can imagine, because it was treated with two different kinds of barrels, wine barrels, and of course, the charred oak barrels that bourbon finds itself in. So delicious. This is the Amador double barrel bourbon, and I love it. What about you? What are you drinking? Well, I have to confess, because it is kind of like breakfast time still. I mean, look, I still have mm. my I still have my breakfast shake here. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I know. But then here. Now here's the gin. See, side by side, <laughs> you know. But yeah, I almost was like, I should put some some kind of a breakfast cocktail together because I've got my Vitamix out and I'm going to whiz up some breakfast drink and I have to have something for today's episode. So maybe I should just throw some booze in there. But I think my blood sugar was a little low. I couldn't really come up with anything creative at that point. But uh, I did find a local Colorado gin that my Justin brought home from Wilbur's Total Beverage last week. Neither of us had tried it before, and I felt like it was so sad that it was being kept closed. So I busted that open, and this is from Old Town Distilling. It's an organic gin, and it's even like numbered, batch 17. And just seriously, I'm like all by myself in my house. (laughs) And I and I say out loud, I talk to myself quite a bit, you guys, but I say out loud, oh, my God, like I was not expecting this to be so good. The It smells very clean. So on the first approach, I was like, oh, I'm I'm in, interested. And then when I tasted it, I was like, it's so citrusy and clean and refreshing. The lavender really comes out. Um, but it's a beautiful gin to sip on the rocks. Remember when you and I were in Denver and we had lunch with Douglas Trapasso and we yeah. had that gin. It was, it was Uncle, Val's. Uncle Val's gin. And they served it on the rocks with uh, just lemon and lime wedge. Mm-hmm. And this is totally, it like took me back to that very moment. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to have to squeeze in a little shout out to this distillery because nice job. Nice, beautiful, clean gin. Uh, You almost don't want to adulterate it with too much of anything. Right, right. So yeah, And that's a Fort Collins distillery, you said? Fort Collins. Nice. Yeah, totally. Good job. Nice. Well, what do we have next? Oh, the interview. The interview. It's time to get something else to drink, guys. Yep. So we're going to sit back and sip and hook you up with this interview with Jordan Cowie, CWE from Canada. Thank you, Jordan, for joining us today. And we are so excited to have you on the show. I think we we met you a couple years ago at one of the Society Wine Educators conferences. And of course, I was in your Canadian wine session last year, which was so educational because I don't, we don't get a lot of Canadian wine down here. So there's a lot of things that we don't get to taste. And so that was a, a real treat for us. So it's a treat for us for you to be on the show today. As we mentioned in the introduction, Jordan's concept of be wineful is one of the things we wanted to talk to him about it. So would you mind telling our listeners what it means to be wineful? Well, thank you first for having me on. But basically, what it is, is is using mindfulness as a point of reference for wine and using wine as a point of reference for mindfulness. So essentially, approaching wine more mindfully. So why I was first getting to the industry, I, like a lot of people, you're attracted by this allure of the sommelier and the sommelier certifications and all those things. And over time, I realized it was just so extremely judgmental. I mean, you're basically being programmed as to what was right, what was wrong. You know, you couldn't make your own opinion. Your teachers were putting it in front of you. You know, this is a good wine. This is a bad wine. And so it's kind of getting people to come back to the enjoyment of wine. I mean, a lot of people do enjoy wine, but a lot of people that get into the industry almost – 
they learn to love to hate it. It's one of those things where it becomes so stressful, so intense, and so absolute. So for wineful, being wineful itself is just being open and non-judgmental in your approach to wine, being aware of your experience with it, with the backstory, you know, being aware of your connection to the land through that bottle to thousands of years of human history through that bottle. So that's where the wineful itself comes. But for me, it's also just as a way of teaching people how to meditate using something that they're comfortable with. And, you know, meditation seems weird and abstract to a lot of people. It can seem scary. But the idea of just picking up something and smelling it isn't so scary anymore. So when you can make it simple for them, they actually try it out and kind of fall in love with it. Right. And how would you describe that? Like, what is the first thing you would tell somebody? Basically, it's to slow down and actually take in the experience. So, I mean, even just taking a regular structured wine tasting and instead of looking at it analytically as we normally do, just observing it as if you've never seen that wine before because you literally haven't. So taking that quick analytical tasting and turning it into, say, like a little five minute long drawn out like visual aroma taste, just really drawing everything out and really savoring every detail. And that's already pushing you in the direction of a meditative experience. Right, because you're only focusing on that one thing. So that's why y'all, the the voices in your head or the monkey mind kind of starts to shut up, you know, and get the back seat so you can really just enjoy the wine. And yeah, it becomes really hard to actually think about other things because, you know, with breath meditation, we first try teaching it to people, their mind you breathe without thinking normally. So when you start thinking about breath, people start thinking, you know, am I breathing right? Am I breathing too fast, too slow, too deep? Is that the right place to feel it? All these thoughts start happening. And also it's easy to get distracted from breath because it's unchanging in a lot of ways. I mean, it changes constantly, but when you when you're first learning, it seems unchanging. But with aroma, it really is constantly changing. So there's always something new to bring your mind back to the point of focus. Um, and we accept that it changes. So, you know, we're, we don't accept that breath changes. To us, breath is just breath. But to us, aroma is something new and unusual that we're not used to. And it's, it's exciting. It kind of pulls the mind in. Well said, Jordan. I like that. Well, tell us about how um, the business got started, Be Wineful, and your uh, business partner. Uh, so, essentially, uh, me and Nally were speaking... Uh, I mean, we've both suffered from agoraphobia. We've both suffered from anxiety disorder and panic disorder. And it was one of those things where when I first met Natalie, uh, she was still having, it was very recent for her. She was still having a lot of trouble with agoraphobia. Um, and one of the first times we met up, we had to be at kind of a bar down the street from her house. And I got talking to her about my experience just to let her be more at ease. And we were talking about what I'd done with using wine to meditate and using mindfulness with wine to be able to contain my career without having to kind of lock myself into the house. And she just kind of said, like, well, why don't you teach that to people? And I was like, well, I teach wine, but I don't teach that. Like, that's not my thing. And we just got talking about it more and more. And we decided that, you know, she comes from a background in music where mindfulness is used in a different way. Um, but she had all the skills for, you know, kind of developing a business. I had the skills for education. So it kind of, we pushed each other forward. Uh, and we kind of pushed each other forward in our process through dealing with anxiety. Um, and so after talking about it on and off for a while, you know, it was one of those things where it's a lot to delve into. I mean, you're having to create something completely new that's never been done before. It's stressful. It's it's hard to do. So we worked on it on and off. Then finally, this past April, we took the complete plunge and just said, you know what, we're doing an event. We're not planning anymore. We've planned everything we can out of this. Um, so we approached a winery we knew. We said, hey, can we throw an event here in about a month and just kind of made it happen. So she's kind of the balance, whereas I'm like the eccentric educator, artist. I get distracted by topics very easy. She's the more detail-oriented business type. And it really, we kind of balance each other out that way. So it's going to be really cool. Yeah, we know. So we, we Val and I know something about partnerships. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And learning how to, to meld those skills together, you know, where you complement each other. Yeah, it's, it's been essential. And also for me, having been in wine for so long, even though I'm trying to approach it non judgmentally, there's still this background of education. There's still this background of almost indoctrination where when I try and create something like this, I still pull these elements into it. So having her there to stop me and go, well, that's not very mindful of you. Is kind of is kind of nice. It's uh, it's it's useful. It's very very handy to have around, and 
have fresh ideas from outside the industry. So I'm curious how that first event at the winery, can you tell us just a little bit, how, how would you describe that event to somebody if you wanted them to sign up for it? How, how did that go? So it's basically we take the idea of an introductory wine course and then we wrap it around meditation. So you, you're kind of pulling them in and you're teaching people how to taste and all this. And then they're just almost accidentally learning to meditate in the process. And then by the end of the uh, by the end of the night, so you start out with just like the basic structural components of wine. So I'll present people with, you know, sweet, sour and bitter um, and have them taste those and just really pay attention to the way their mouth reacts. And then I have them compare that to a wine. So they're slowly paying more and more attention. And then you kind of push them towards aroma and really kind of looking at aroma in forms of thoughts and memories instead of absolute um, items that are right and wrong. And then you kind of give them a wine to work with with that. And then you kind of slowly build up more and more through different elements of wine. And I actually end with a 15-minute meditation using nothing but wine. So it's kind of slowly introducing people to the concept without realizing that's happening so that by the end of the session, they can actually meditate right away and just jump right into it. Because I feel like what benefits it presents for consumers is, is wonderful because it lets them learn about wine, but also for people in the industry to kind of bring us back from this stressful interaction with wine is important because like people studying for their exam certifications and all that, it can be a real dangerous path to just getting completely burnt out. And, and we don't want that. Yeah, speak it, brother. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think that's great that you're being a voice out there that's talking about something that kind of just hush hush most of the time. So I think people will appreciate that. And I know that those of us that are educators or in the industry would appreciate a class like that to kind of reset and um, come at come at it a little bit differently. Um, one of the things on your Be Wineful website is uh, the about the 30-day challenge. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's something we've just launched. So essentially, I mean, we're based here in Niagara in Ontario. We can obviously travel for that. But for the most part, if people want to learn in person, the current events are here. So we want to find a way of, A, letting people from outside Niagara experience the idea and try it out. And not just that, maybe people who have wanted to meditate but have a hard time following through on it, giving them a set way of kind of getting started and building a habit. Uh, So create the 30-day challenge where essentially the goal is to do something meditative, even if not a full meditation for 30 days straight. So even if it's just, you know, spending a little bit longer and doing uh, like a mindful eating exercise or even a mindful tasting or doing a full, you know, mindfulness meditation or or even just a simple breathing meditation. Um, And, you know, just little daily reminders, little motivations, um, lessons along the way. So, you know, each week giving them kind of a set plan for that week with new, with, you know, new meditations, new wines to try. Um, the goal is to, you know, get people out there trying new things, trying meditation and creating an enjoyable connection with it and also creating a connection with something that they do every day. Because one of the hard things with meditation is remind, like remembering to do it at first, uh, because, you know, meditation isn't really drawn into a lot of the things. It's kind of its own isolated concept. And one of the big ideas, you know, in marketing and in education is, is triggers. Uh, so if you can trigger somebody to remember something, they're more likely to do it. And so we were thinking is, well, you know, it's already connected to wine. So if we really build this connection, so every time somebody sees a wine glass, they think, oh, I need to meditate. It's a really good way of reminding yourself without that kind of nagging feeling of, you know, a reminder on your phone or something like that. Creating a habit, right, is the hardest part. That's been for me trying to meditate and go, okay, how do I make this a daily thing? And if it's not connected to something, it feels like it's on your to do list. A lot of times, you know what you need to do. And having something or somebody remind you can be annoying like you're like no i need i know i need to do this but i'm busy whereas if you just remind yourself almost accidentally it doesn't feel like that it's like oh yeah i I, I should probably do that it'd be a good idea yeah i know i need to do this but i'm busy but if you don't do it you're not gonna sustain that pace does that make sense 
Yes, yeah, and that's it's definitely one of the hard parts. Is you have to almost you have to mm-hmm. want to meditate. It's, you have to get to that point where it's for you. It's not because you're being told to. It's not because you know it's anything else. It's because you've made that you've accepted that. I need this, so I'm going to give it to myself now. Yeah, and it's it's hard to get there, and so that's why, like you know, like I said, with this, you know, making it somewhat fun, I feel like it makes it somewhat easier for people to get to that point because if there's one thing that people in general are really bad at is caring for yourself. Even some of the most compassionate people always forget to be compassionate to right. themselves. Um, and that's, it's dangerous. It's a very slippery slope. Um, you can spend too much time worrying about everybody else and just, you completely go by the wayside. So it's like you said, you know, finding those few moments for yourself it's hard, but when you finally make that decision to do it, it's life changing. It's just like even if you are busy at work and you know you've got I'm, I'm going to throw yoga back in there because that's where it started for a lot of us. You know, it's like 530. OK, I'm going to yoga. Oh, you're going to yoga. I'm like, yes, I'm going to yoga or I'm going to kill y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that goes. But anyway, <laughs> it is true, though. It is one of those I think it's one of those first places where people are exposed to the idea of meditation. Um, and again, it's. You know, it's one of those things where people are drawn to yoga and you go and you get this kind of, you have, well, meditative movement and then meditation at the end in most cases. And it's, it exposes people to the idea it is a, another important aspect of, you know, your overall health. Oh, yeah. And depending on where you go, I'm referring now back to your wineful uh, approach to wine. I remember sitting in a meditation class where we all had like a little Satsuma orange and we had to eat that mindfully. It was like first we had to hold it and touch it and look at the color. And there was nothing in the room but a candle, you and the orange, right? And then you had to smell it before the skin was peeled and then, you know, peel it and then taste it and let it sit in your mouth for a while and smell it again. And and we, I mean, it took us like, you know, 15 minutes to eat this orange, but this tiny little orange, but it was the process of going through it. And so listening to you talk about the wine reminded me of a meditation class where that little orange was like your world for just 15 minutes. Yeah, I actually used the exact same thing this past, so this past Thursday. I did one of my the topic was uh, aroma and meditation, and I actually did a mindful eating exercise with a lychee, uh, because it's one of those things that people really don't know what leeches leeches are for the most part, or you know people in the industry are more likely to be aware. But just getting somebody to spend you know ten minutes with this fruit that they had absolutely no idea what to make of it, it was a really cool experience for a lot of them. Yeah, what kind of uh, feedback have you gotten from some of your participants? It's one of those things where, like, the very first event we did, it, you know, it was almost like a prototype event, and the reaction was just purely they had no idea how much of an experience they were actually having with wine that they were ignoring. Uh, so, for example, just like the vivid images that were actually passing through their mind as they were tasting wine that they just assumed weren't there. They just assumed it wasn't a, a really a thing. And so when they tasted it, in the meditation, they were just explaining like these vivid images and memories and stuff that were going through their head, and they were just amazed by how much they were uncovering. Um, and then with this past series we've done, been five events, and we allowed people to come to you know one event or multiple. And the ones who have come to multiple events, I mean, you build a practice that way. They've just you know absolutely been fascinated by it. It's one of those things where this past week we reminded them of you know it's the last this. Coming Thursday is the last one of this current series, uh, and you know we don't have any more planned until September. And they are actively disappointed. It's like, wow, I, I've actually, you know, I built something here because they they viewed it as their kind of weekly relaxation. You know, they've set aside this two hour period every week, where even if they don't necessarily take the time every day, they know this two hour period is a time to come relax, learn about wine, and learn about themselves. Uh, so it's been some really, really powerfully positive interactions. And then, you know, the further somebody gets in, as we've gone in more and more weeks with some of these people, the lessons they're learning about themselves, they've just been, it's been really, really touching. It's been really cool. Yeah, those those personal lessons are priceless. So I'm sure they're really grateful. Well, tell us how on the 30-day challenge, how can people get involved with that? What are, what are the steps they need to do to sign up? And what does it cost? Uh, so the 30-day challenge is something we're doing for free. Uh, so basically, you would go to uh, bewindful.com, uh, sign up with your email address, and 
you will start receiving uh, the weekly lessons and meditations and everything like that, little reminder emails. Uh, we just want to spread awareness of Be Mindful. You know, it's an idea that's completely brand new. Um, and, you know, people are sometimes confused by it at first. We want to just give people a way of, you know, trying it out, trying out the idea and seeing what they think. That's terrific. Now, the events that you're doing, because you are in Canada, I'm guessing, are they mostly with Canadian wine? And if so, can you tell us kind of what you're doing with Canadian wine to to educate people? Because we haven't even really talked about Canadian wine on our podcast yet. And so we've had a few people uh, perk up about, you know, when we mention Canadian wine. So maybe you could give some little highlights or, or trends in what's going on with Canadian wine right now. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely focused on Canadian wine. I mean, all of our events are at wineries. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of the requirement to be supportive, I, I think, at that point. And I would do so willingly uh, anyways. But one of the things that I'm noticing a lot here in Canada is we're finally coming to terms with our identity. We're not trying as as often to be somewhere else anymore. So when we first started, we're a very recent wine region. I mean, the earliest true quality winery didn't open until about 1975. So, I mean, by any standards, we're a very young region. Yeah. And so, you know, by the end of the 70s, we had maybe four wineries. By the end of the 80s, there was about 12 to 14. Um, in 2000, there was probably about 30 or 40. And now we're sitting at about 110 here in Niagara and about 180 in Ontario and about probably 450 to 600 Canada wide. Uh, so, I mean, it's just spread, you know, there's more wine, there's about 300 wineries in BC now, there's almost double the amount as there's in Ontario, but they tend to be smaller. But what happened early on, when you're that young, you're surrounded by all these big players, uh, you know, we're on the border with the US and right around the time that we uh, started as an industry, free trade became a very big thing. So, especially California wines gained a lot more access to our market because they'd previously been completely, not shut out, but they were we were so subsidized that they couldn't get in. So Canadians finally got exposed to all these external wines, just as our industry was kind of becoming uh, a quality industry. So we've had to really kind of fight with our identity early on, where we were trying to be California. We were trying to be the old world. You were fighting back and forth to decide which we were. Um, and over time, I think we've realized that in reality, we're kind of an old world region in the new world. Uh, so our wines are becoming very clean, but we're not trying to go for that pure ripeness, uh, big, intense wine approach that you would see elsewhere. We're going for very food-oriented wines, so we've developed a food culture almost from scratch. You know, food and wine in North America isn't really a big thing. It's kind of wine and then food, and they're separate concepts. You know, you drink wine with food, but they're very isolated, uh, whereas here in Ontario, the two have developed completely intertwined. Uh, so we're creating wines that are designed purposely for food. Same in BC, their their style there is the wines are so food friendly. They're a little bit richer than us because it's a, it's a warmer region. But again, it's not pushing it too far. It's creating these really structurally intense wines. Uh, and that's taken a while to come to terms with because it takes a lot to stand out on your own, especially the Canadian mentality is, I hate to say sometimes the stereotypes are true, where we're a fairly passive culture. So for us to stand up on our own and say, no, we're not going to do what everybody else is doing. We're going to do this and we're going to do it well. And eventually people are going to like it. And it's been really cool to see that transformation happen. The other biggest thing for us is for the longest time, we didn't, well, we still don't export much. You'll see some ice wines and you'll see some producers exporting wine into the U.S. and into foreign markets. Our biggest foreign markets for the most part are in China and Japan and other parts of East Asia for ice wine. Um, but essentially for the longest time, if you asked winemakers here, it's very counterintuitive and, you know, pro business professors and stuff at the universities tried convincing them otherwise, but again, the Canadian mindset and they would all, winemakers here would always say, well, you know, we're not going to start exporting until we've, until we own our own market, which makes sense. But Canadians kind of follow the leader. So like, you know, if people in New York were buying Canadian wine, Canadians would buy it by the truckload. And so what's happening now is we're, we are finally, after enough willpower, starting to conquer our own market. Uh, so, you know, wineries that when I first got into the industry five years ago would be sitting on, you know, thousands upon thousands of cases of wine they just couldn't sell. 
are the exact same wineries that now can't make wine fast enough for the demand. So it's been a really cool transformation these last few years. Uh, but yeah, those are probably the two biggest changes is the fact that Canadians are now really accepting our own wines and also that we finally truly found an identity. Um, and that, I think, will really drive us forward. That's great news. Your stories, while they are inspiring and they are very special, we're kind of curious. Everybody that comes on this show, we do ask them to share an embarrassing wine story as well. So do you have anything that's a little funny or something that you can laugh about now looking looking back? Uh, definitely. So after all that happened, um, I had finally started to overcome the anxiety and all that. I became a very confident person. I mean, in the wine world, the people who've seen me speak and stuff, they wouldn't they, they get the confidence and all that. And I'm, I'm not traditionally, I mean, I'm anxious. I used to be a very shy person, kind of like you said you were. Um, and so with this newfound confidence, I really trusted my abilities a little too much. And so there was a winemaker's dinner at the winery I was working at. Um, and we used to serve ice wine in these little, like, almost like miniature martini glasses. So instead of like the regular dessert wine glasses, they were very top heavy. And nobody wanted to serve the ice wine course. I'm like, okay, guys, I'll just give me the tray. I've done this a thousand times. I'll go out there, drop off the ice wine. It's no big deal. Um, like the most confident person ever. It's like, I've got this. I don't know why you guys are all afraid. Um, and I walked out into the room, got about halfway through, got all the ice wine. It was, you know, putting ice wine down. And one of these things that you can't foresee as a server if somebody suddenly deciding to not realize you're standing behind them with a tray full of glasses and back up into you. Oh. Uh, so I was like super confident, like I've got this, you guys shouldn't be afraid, you know, I can do this. Um, and I went out there and put all the glasses down, all of a sudden somebody backs up and the chair hits me, tray starts wobbling, and because all the glasses are top heavy, it wobbles even more and managed to save a few of them, but most of it dropped to the ground. And in this room is like the owner, you know, the winery manager, all these, like all their guests they invited out, the winemaker, all this. And the room just goes silent. I'm standing right in the middle. Like I was right in the middle, dropping off a glass with this half empty tray of knocked over glasses, ice wine surrounding me everywhere on the ground. I mean, ice wine's not the cheapest thing ever. So, you know, when you drop right. 20 small glasses of it, it's, uh, you're just sitting there and looking at the owner like, oh no, this is bad. This is really <laughs> bad. <laughs> and then on top of that, because I just told my boss and like all the other staff, like, no, I've got this. I've done this a thousand times. It's even more embarrassing. And so, yeah, <laughs> I think that's a that's probably my most embarrassing story is standing in the middle of a room full of people after cockily telling everybody else that I've, I've got this. Oh, my gosh, Jordan, that that is a great story. And I think we'll probably um, we'll probably give have uh, Steph wrap it up here in a minute, but I'm just curious. I have a bottle of Inniskillen in my fridge and I feel like I should have it open when I'm talking with you, but do you have a favorite ice wine or something you could recommend to our listeners? It's one of those unfortunate things that some of the best ice wines never make it out of the country. So one of the companies that you could definitely get ice wine from and they produce phenomenal wines um, would be, uh, there's a winery here in Niagara called Pilateri Estates Winery. Um, they're probably the largest estate producer of ice wine in the world. They're one of the largest family-run wineries here in Niagara. Um, in the last you know, 25 years, they've grown from, I think, starting about 10,000 cases up to about 130,000 cases now. Uh, so it's a real success story. And ice wine is kind of what gives them their fame. Um, they do a really cool wide variety. I mean, their Vidal ice wine... Um, Actually, the, it was the first ice wine, if I remember right, that the Queen tried, and she actually wrote, had them write, well, no, she didn't write herself, but her staff wrote a letter to them saying how wonderful she thought it was. Uh, so, I mean, their Vidal's wonderful. They do some really cool uh, Cab Sauv ice wines. Um, so, if you spot something from them, as far as like a family producer that you're likely to find in the States, um, that would be, uh, I, I'm just, I'm assuming most of your listeners are probably in the US. Um, that is probably one of the best wines uh, you could try. And you'd likely be able to find. Um, Which one was that again? Uh, so it's Pilateri Estates Winery. So I mean, their Vidal is quite uh, easy to find uh, outside the country, um, as well as perhaps their Cab Sauve uh, or Riesling Ice Wines. They do a huge range of other ones. I mean, they won, uh, I think it was Serrat du Monde. They won uh, one of the awards there for their sparkling Syrah Ice Wine, Ooh. which is like all sorts of things all at once. 
And so, I mean, they've won all sorts of awards everywhere. But if you spot something, really anything by them uh, in the ice wine category, it's it's worth trying. But you're most likely to find the Vidal. That's great. Actually, we do have some supporters and listeners in Canada as well. So hopefully they'll be able to find those those things. And uh, I think I think I'm going to shut up now, Steph. I'm going to let you bring it on home. (laughs) Well, just to wrap it up, we do want to know how everyone can connect with you on the social media spaces and online. So, Jordan, how do we do that? So my personal accounts on Every social media site are at JD Cowie, uh, so JD C O W E. Um, be Wineful is again also very simple. It's at Be Wineful. So for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, they're all the same. Um, and also, you know, our website is BeWineful.com. Um, that's acting as my also unofficial website right now because it's a lot of effort just doing one. Never mind two. Um, <laughs> and also, I have a personal rule of if anybody ever has any questions about any of the above, they can just email me directly. So Jordan at bewineful dot com. Um, I've always made a kind of personal rule of if anybody asks me any question, if they've attended any of my seminars, anything, they can always email me and just ask away. Um, it's just something I, I like to do. Oh, that's great. Well. I definitely am feeling uh, be thankful right now. So uh, (laughs) I really appreciate that you made the time uh, today on a Tuesday to be with Valerie and myself. And we're sad that we're not going to see you at the conference this year, but um, I have a good feeling we will see you at the one uh, 2018. Oh, you definitely will. I won't miss two years in a row. Uh, That'd be an awful travesty. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> well, Jordan, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us today. And uh, we wish you an awesome rest of the week. And, and again, can't wait to see you next year. And thank you for having me on. If you ever do want to discuss Canadian wine, just let me know and I'll be happy to do so. But otherwise, enjoy the conference and good luck with uh, the rest of your week and your year. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Jordan because I I was sitting here listening to him. His voice is like butter. I just, yeah. And his experiences. I know. I know. It was really fulfilling to be sitting here and sharing that information with the world. You know, knowing that what he's telling us, Val, we are going to send out into the universe because it wasn't just a private conversation. I mean, this is going out to everybody. And I was like, so thankful and so excited that, you know, we have so many things in common with him and things that we can share Mm -hmm. and relate to. And then he's got so many great, like, I hate to use the word authentic sometimes because it's overused, but you know, he has, he has this authenticity and then the buttery voice on top of it. You're just like, Oh yes. You know, that's so cool. Yeah. And the bravery, you know, I I have to say that his age, like I could be his mom. Okay. Um, (laughs) To have gone through what he's gone through and accomplished what he's accomplished at that age. And then to be, unabashedly sharing that with all of you guys you you got to listen to something very very special today we really hope that you'll reach out to him and and take him up on his offer to check out how to be more wineful you know especially if you're approaching wine from such a way where it can become a little bit like okay fine yes i miss the white pepper and the gruner because i'm rotundo deaf or whatever (laughs) you know and these things that frustrate you about learning about wine he takes you back to a place where it's kind of like, you know what? It it shouldn't be that way. Mm-hmm. It should be enjoyable and it should be mindful and meditative, especially if you're drinking a really, really nice wine. When we, we talk about meditation wine a lot when I was in Italy and there are wines that are a little bit more complex and expensive and and so much craftsmanship goes into them. And I do consider them like the first time I got my lips on uh, Jasko Grovner's Breg. Mm-hmm. And I was just my I mean in a corner by myself, you know, with my nose in the glass and everybody's moving on to the Brunellos and the Barolos. And I'm like, no, no, I'm still on the white back here. And I'm, I'm in Grovner land. And I'm just, you know, putting myself in those, in those amphorae and the, the way that wine was drinking like a red and it would sit on your tongue forever. And 
when you can have that experience with wine, it is. It is very, very special. And for him to be able to bring that to us, I'm so grateful. Yeah, definitely. Well, one of the things that he did mention in the interview was how he would guide people through a tasting. And he mentioned sweet, salty, and sour taste. So I have a little factoid to drop on you guys. Ooh, nice transition. Like that. Yeah. I do. Well, so uh, this kind of came on my radar, and I thought it would be fun to share as a factoid. Have you heard of the taste called oleogustus? Well, no. Yeah, well, here we go. So everybody knows sweet, salty, bitter, sour, right? So we are we are taught that at a very young age. But along comes the umami taste, right? So everybody says, oh, there's five tastes. And some of you are like, I'm still not with you, Steph. I don't know much about umami. Well, wait for it. We'll go back to that. But in the recent years, scientists have been studying oleogustus, which they're saying might just be the sixth taste. It's the taste of fat. And it's a Latin word. And it means like the distinct flavor of fat or fatty acid. So separate from that fatty texture, that's a totally different other thing. We're talking about the flavor, uh, the taste exactly. And so when it's combined with other flavors, it tastes very delicious. And that's exactly how umami is described as well. Um, Umami makes other foods taste very delicious. And so when when they're all alone, either this oleogustus or umami, they're not like not very good on the, all by themselves. But right. umami, for those of you who are still wondering, what am I talking about? Because, you know, umami is a Japanese word. The Japanese discovered it, and so they named it. And it's the savory taste. And it corresponds mm-hmm. to glutamate in food, as in monosodium glutamate. And that's a naturally occurring amino acid that's found in a variety of foods dried mushrooms, tomatoes, soy sauce, Parmesan cheese, and many others. I'm just giving a brief overview. But that is something that has really taken off. I mean, there are food trucks and restaurants and all sorts of stuff now using the word umami. And it's it's really focused also in some wine tasting now when you're doing food pairings. So if you want to geek out some more about umami, I did find a pretty cool website that's got some great graphics called umamiinfo.com. And there's a link in our show notes. But the research is still going on with oleogustus to prove it is officially a primary taste. So that is still being um, looked at. And furthermore, I found it interesting in my uh, research that... There might be other tastes out there that are still unidentified. So I think there will be a a lot more uh, to come with just, you know, how we approach taste and flavor. And it's growing. It's not just salty, bitter, sour, and sweet anymore. So watch out for that, guys. Yep, and pretty soon Pluto is going to be a taste too. So stay tuned as we pair wine with new planets. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. That was fake news, oh, but it's still funny. Fake news, fake news. Yes, absolutely. Well, what's not fake news is our wino radar. And we have to send a reminder out that our first book club, Bianca Bosker's Cork Dork, a wine field adventure among obsessive sommeliers, big bottle hunters, and rogue scientists who taught me to live for taste. But uh, this episode will be host- hosted in about probably early mid-August, about two or three weeks. Yeah, I'm excited so. about that. And I'm also very excited about a trip coming up to New Zealand in January 2018. I will be headed out that way to the South Island, specifically in central Otago. And because this is on my Wino radar, I just happened to see in my Twitter feed a post from the drinks business, thanks, of course, to our buddy Joe Fatterini, that there is a article called the 10, uh, 10 of the best Twitter wine feeds to follow. And I have the link here. And when I clicked on it, of course, I was like, oh, we've got to be in there, Val. You know, but 
Anyhow, I clicked on it and I found a winery in Central Otago as one of the best Twitter wine feeds to follow. And it's at Two Paddocks. It's T-W-O-P-A-D-D-O-C-K-S by written by Sam Neal, the actor and winemaker of Two Paddocks Winery. So I am going to be looking at that. That is totally on my wino radar. And if anybody listening has any recommendations or connections in Central Otago, please feel free to reach out to me on social media, email, or leave a a speak pipe message if you feel so inclined. And uh, I would love to get any kind of recommendations um, for Central Otago wineries. Oh my gosh, that's going to be so much fun. Yes, I'm very excited about that. And also because it kind of goes along with my shout out because Celia has been helping me also make some connections in New Zealand. And she just put me in touch with Misha Wilkinson from Misha's Vineyard. And so thank you, Celia. Um, I can't wait to see you in Portland. Val and I will definitely be giving you big hugs. And uh, maybe we can brainstorm some some new material um, for future episodes. But Love to reconnect and find out more about what's going on with the New Zealand School of Food and Wine. And, Absolutely. you know, we definitely want to say thank you to Jordan for being on our show, too. And thank you for everyone who's listening. And thank you to our Patreon supporters. We've got to send out some Patreon love today to our tenacious tasters. Jeff from We Like Drinking, Lynn from Savor the Harvest, Sebastian from Sassy Italy Tours. We have a slew of it's not five o'clock and we don't care listeners. That's what we're talking about. Meg, Clay, John, Andrew, Aswani, Chantal, Mary Lou and Kathy from all over the States and Canada. And then our tastemaker listener in Scotland and our winetastic listener, Laura. I mean, this family is growing and we just love that you're all jumping on the Patreon bandwagon, that you like what you hear and that you like spending time with us in our Wine to Five communities. And why else should you support the show? Well, You get early releases of all the episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, swag. And every month we draw a winner for a surprise wine gift for any Patreon supporter at the $2 Tastemaker listener level and higher. So if you want to get in on the monthly wine goodies, go to our Patreon page for details. Patreon.com slash wine to five podcast. And please subscribe to the show if this is the first time you're listening. You can help other people subscribe and show them how to do it on their phone or their device. You can also leave us any kind of question or comment about any episode, or maybe you've just kind of had a question rolling around in the back of your head. And we do have a means to leave us a voicemail message on our speak pipe. So you can find that on our website and in our show notes. You can also join the conversation on our private Facebook group called Wine25 Community. And we would also appreciate any reviews on Apple Podcasts or iHeartRadio. On our website, you will find our store and you can also connect with us on the social spaces, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Google+. You can also connect with Val on Twitter. Her handle is at Wine Gal Unboxed and as Vina with Val on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And I am also on Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter as The Wine Heroine. And you can find me on Facebook. So until next week's book review. Yay! (laughs) Uh, Cheers, Val. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Wine to Five podcast. Be sure to check us out at Facebook slash Wine TWO 5. And tune in next week for more fun and useful SIP tips. Tips.